I'm going to ask you to do something that as a former teacher and principal, I would have thought twice about doing with my former students. Please take out your phones. <laughs> go ahead, I trust you. All right, I want you to go ahead to your list of contacts, and I would like you to start scrolling through the names. As you do, I want you to consider how many of the folks in your phone have graduated college? How many of them are healthcare professionals, business leaders, engineers? How many of them, would you guess, have set a budget, bought a car, or own a home? Okay, last thing. I want you to find the person in your phone that you consider to be the most connected the one that you would go to if you were looking for new opportunities. Go ahead and find their name and lock their name in your mind. Okay, congratulations, you passed today's assignment. <laughs> and now please put your phones away. <laughs> Chances are each of you has a couple hundred valuable connections in your phone. These are the people that you would go to for support or if you were looking for new opportunities, they're also the one you'd connect your niece to if she was interested in a particular career or if your son's looking for an internship. They're your friends, your colleagues, your network. In that brief exercise, you just assessed what's called your social capital or the breadth, depth, and value of those you're connected to personally and professionally. Literally, it's your most valuable resource. Now, meet Michaela. She's 18 and a senior in high school. She's the president of a robotics club and plays on the school volleyball team. She loves math. She overuses her highlighters in all of her honors classes. And she is contemplating a career as an engineer or an entrepreneur. If you had the opportunity to meet Michaela, you would immediately recognize her potential. Even though she's growing up in a poor community with limited access to opportunities, she remains focused and is dedicated to excelling academically and athletically. Her family's super supportive. But here's the thing. Michaela and millions of students like her actually face tragically slim chances of realizing their dreams. Let's consider the data. If we start with a cohort of 100 high-performing but under-resourced ninth graders across the United States, less than half are going to graduate high school with the habits, grades, and test scores to succeed in college. Only about half of them will actually matriculate to competitive schools. And four years later, just 15% of students will graduate with a marketable major and good job prospects. Six to 12 months after college graduation, only 3% will land a great first job that puts them on the path to opportunity and financial independence. From 100 to three. And I'll remind you, these aren't average students. These are the high performing ones, the ones taking advanced placement courses, excelling on the ACT and SAT, the ones leading their clubs and sports teams. These are the ones that we would all agree are supposed to make it. So, what's going on here? Well, the research is clear. Michaela and her family lack what studies show to be the primary predictor to a life of opportunity. True, her family's income plays a role, and so does the quality of school she attends but it turns out there's a more significant factor at play. It's about who Michaela knows. It's about who her family knows. It's the contacts they have and don't have in their phones. It's their social capital. So what this means is that even when Michaela crushes it academically, even when her school and teachers pour Herculean efforts into preparing her for college and career, and even when she secures a spot in a competitive college, there remains a massive gap between Michaela and the people that can connect her to opportunities in the real world. 
And this impacts every part of her life, from the internships that she's not hearing about to the jobs that she doesn't even know exist, from the tips that she's not getting on how to create a budget or practical advice on how to navigate the college application process. The significance of networks is not a new concept. Researchers have been studying this for decades. And what they have been telling us is that the diversity of a child's relationships has a larger impact on their future opportunities than nearly everything else in their lives, including their academic performance. When I first learned about the long-term impact of the lack of social capital for my students, I was devastated. I've spent the last 20 years working with students from under-resourced communities, including nine of those as a middle school and high school principal. And during that time, I obsessed over GPAs and ACT scores. My staff and I worked tirelessly to get students up to grade level and then prepare them for the rigors of college. I believed, we all did, that as long as our students excelled academically, doors of opportunity would open for them and they would be set. I told students every day that if they showed up, worked hard, got good grades, stayed out of trouble, they would be on the path to opportunity. Cameron, Anaya, Jordan, they trusted me. But I was wrong. The truth is, by focusing on a narrow set of academic outcomes alone, I failed to provide my student with the one asset they needed most, connections to real people that could share advice, resources, and opportunities outside of the context of a school. And frankly, something as a school that we can never provide. To be clear, Students must absolutely be equipped with the knowledge and skills to thrive in whatever pathway they choose. But while a great education is a necessity, it is not sufficient. We cannot simply educate kids out of poverty. And yet that's exactly what we've been trying to do for decades. The net result? It means millions of students across our country are not realizing their potential for them the American dream is just that, a fantasy. Employers are spending their time competing over the 3% and retraining and reskilling the other 97%. Boil this down to dollars and cents, and it means that as a country, we are leaving billions of dollars of GDP on the table. And perhaps most consequently, it means that as a society, we are becoming more fragmented more siloed, more mistrustful. This impacts all of us. I wish I could stand here right now and tell you that schools and districts have since become laser focused on expanding student social capital, but they're not, at least not yet. I am coming to you from the front lines of American public education to offer that as a country, we have been putting together an incomplete puzzle of long-term student success. And the thing is, is that schools and teachers can't fill those pieces on their own. So, what's the solution? You. How do I know? Because each of you has social capital. You showed it to yourself just a few minutes ago. You're a healthcare professional, an artist, an engineer, a lawyer, or you know one. Right now, you or the people on your phone are the very people that could quite literally unlock opportunities for students. So what's the barrier? Well, for one, Michaela likely doesn't live near you and you're busy with your own personal and professional responsibilities. And because our country is more economically segregated now than it's been in the last 50 years, it's actually very unlikely that you'll cross paths with Michaela, let alone support her in a material way. 
But what if you could? What if you had the privilege to meet Michaela, understand her goals, and then leverage your own talents and resources to empower her? Would you? In 2021, I co-founded Backers with a team of educators, business leaders, and technologists. We set out to answer that one simple question. What might happen if Michaela had you on her phone? And what would happen if schools and teachers and districts had a scalable way to expand their student social capital that wasn't limited by time or place? The concept is straightforward, leverage technology to connect students like Michaela with a diverse network of adults across a wide range of careers, geographies, and life experiences. At the same time, we aim to give adults a more convenient and fulfilling way to leverage their skills and give back to an amazing young person full of aspiration. So while schools focus on academic performance and outcomes, we come alongside schools and we engage employers, professional organizations, and adults to build out the non-academic skills and to diversify student networks. We've been at it a couple years and we're encouraged by our early results. To date, we've established over 2,000 new relationships between students and adults. Our data reveals over 43,000 instances of advice, support, and encouragement. And we have seen the beautiful impact of the power of social capital, including students getting jobs and internships previously unknown and inaccessible to them. You might be wondering right now, well, how helpful can I actually be? The truth is, is that you have way more to offer than you might think. Let me explain. First, when students like Michaela are connected to a diverse network of adults, it raises her aspirations and it shows her what's possible. We have to remember that a young person can never be what they never see. Second, every single one of you has valuable personal and professional experiences that you've uncovered over the course of your life. And what that means is that you can offer practical advice on things that Michaela's immediate family or friends might not have experience with. At 18, that might be how to apply for college. And in a few years, it might be what to do when you get your first credit card. And lastly, once you have the opportunity to build a relationship with Michaela and she is nearing the end of her journey in college, she can take out her phone and inquire about opportunities and resources and people that you know. So where do we go from here? The question now becomes, how can we expand students like Michaela's network and bridge the gap that currently exists from where they are now to where they aspire to be? I wanna offer three ways that we can all meet the moment. The first, connect. Take a look at the young people in your life, your children, your nieces, your nephews, your family friends. Inquire about their goals and their aspirations. And then ask this one very simple follow-up question. Hey, if I could connect you to someone that can support you on that goal or that's in that particular field, would you want to talk with them? What this does is it starts the necessary work of expanding this young person's networks while putting their goals into action. The cool thing is, is that that person is probably already in your phone. Two, advocate. Every single one of you is connected to some school in some way, whether it's where your children or your grandchildren attend school, your local middle school or high school, or even your alma mater. Inquire about ways that they are committed to expanding students' social capital and diversifying relationships support or even help fund programs that bring mentorship and career exposure opportunities to the school. Three, bridge social capital 
is not a zero sum resource. So while you are expanding the connections of, the own, of your own young people in your life and advocating in and with schools, get involved in the life of a young person like Michaela. Volunteer your time, offer mentorship, or find other creative ways to get in the game. Let's be the bridge that comes alongside the great work that Michaela, her family, and her schools are doing to connect them to opportunities not currently at their fingertips. So, how about our friend Michaela? Well, over the last year, she's had some fantastic people in her phone. She was first able to connect with Catherine, who shared with her a local selective internship opportunity that she didn't even know existed. Piece of the puzzle. Then she had the opportunity to hop on a call with Julie, who gave her feedback on her resume, her cover letter, and made sure that she could submit the best application possible. Piece of the puzzle. And finally, just a few days before her phone interview for this internship, she got on the phone with David and spent just 30 minutes practicing interview questions. Piece of the puzzle. Armed with a plan, some practice, and some confidence, she nailed the interview. Michaela got the job. Yeah. And isn't this how it should be? Student works hard, family does their best, and the community and neighbors leans in to fill in any gaps. I suspect it happened for many of you. It's happening for Michaela right now, and it certainly ought to happen for the millions of students out there aspiring to be the best versions of themselves. They just need a few more pieces of the puzzle to come together. Be the missing piece. Thank you.